Good morning, sir. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. So before we uh, move to call Helen Rose, um, can I say something briefly about ongoing disclosure? Of course. Um, as um, everyone will know, following the hearing held on the 5th of September this year, you decided that the inquiry could commence hearing from phase four witnesses today, and you subsequently issued a statement giving further directions. Uh, as has been made clear on previous occasions, when the inquiry has addressed the issue of uh, late disclosure, all of those um, interested in the work of the inquiry, including but not limited to witnesses and core participants, should understand that the fact that the inquiry has decided to continue to hear evidence does not mean that the witnesses from whom evidence is about to be taken will be giving evidence just once. The inquiry will not hesitate to request a further witness statement or statements from witnesses and call witnesses back to give evidence in the event that sufficiently relevant material is either disclosed before the witness gives evidence but the inquiry has not had the opportunity to process it all such evidence is disclosed after a witness gives evidence. This is not only to ensure that all sufficiently relevant material is put to witnesses, but also in fairness to witnesses, so that they have the opportunity to address all sufficiently relevant material. Uh, to put into context what I've just said, I should say that since the 3rd of July uh, this year, so just before the first disclosure hearing, the post office has disclosed approximately 23,000 potentially relevant documents to the inquiry. This included disclosures right up until the end of last week, with 1,500 documents coming in on Thursday and 1,500 documents coming in on Friday of last week. Of those approximately 23,000 documents, on the basis of how the post office has categorized them when disclosing them, approximately 15,200 are said by the post office to relate to phase four of the inquiry. Many, but not all of these documents have been provided in response to the three disclosure failings that you identified following the disclosure hearing held on the 4th of July, namely search terms, family documents, and deduplication. These documents relate to a range of requests made by the inquiry to the post office dating back to the 8th of October 2021 and running up until the 5th of June 2023. It follows from what I've said that a high number of potentially relevant documents have been disclosed in the recent past by the post office, and many of them are presently being processed by the inquiry, albeit a large number of them appear to be duplicates of material already disclosed to the inquiry. As I've said, no one should be surprised if witnesses have to be recalled as a consequence of this and other disclosure issues. I'd say you're still on mute. Thank you, Mr. Beer. I don't propose to add to what you've said, but I certainly endorse it. Thank you. And just so that everyone knows, um, uh, we propose to sit until 1.30 p.m. today rather than the 2 p.m. that was advertised. And that, I have to confess, is due to my personal circumstances, so I apologise for that. Thank you, sir. Uh, might I therefore call, and she's giving evidence uh, remotely, Helen Rose, please? Of course, yes. Yes. Good morning, Ms Rose. Um, please could you repeat after me? I do solemnly... I do solemnly, sincerely and truly, sincerely and truly, declare and affirm, declare and affirm, that the evidence I shall give, that the evidence I shall give, shall be the truth, shall be the truth, the whole truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, nothing but the truth. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs Rose, my name is Jason Beer, as you know, and I ask questions on behalf of the inquiry. Can you give us your full name, please? Helen Rose. Uh, thank you for attending remotely uh, to assist the inquiry in its work and for previously providing a witness statement to the inquiry. You should have in front of you a hard copy of that witness statement. It's in your name and dated the 10th of May 2023. 
if you turn to the last page of it, which is page nine, there's a signature. Is that your signature? It is, yes. And are the contents of that statement true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yes. For the purposes of the transcript, the URN is WITN 00790100. That need not be displayed. Can I start by asking you some questions about your um, career qualifications and experience? You joined the post office in 1997, is that right? Correct, yes. Uh, did you have any professional qualifications prior to joining the post office? No. Having joined in 1997, you worked in what you describe in your witness statement as head office branches. Can you um, describe what a head office branch is, please? It was a uh, post office counters, but it was the main branches, the crown officers. So um, what we know is um, crown office branches? Correct, yeah. And whereabouts were you based? I was based at Huddersfield. And what responsibilities did your role entail when you were working in the Crown Office branch? Serving customers, uh, dealing, I think it did eventually go onto Horizon. I can't confirm if it was Horizon when I started at the Crown Office. Okay, so um, you were working on the counters essentially? Correctly. I think you remained there until 1999 when you became an auditor, is that right? Correct, yeah. And if that chronology is right, I think it follows that uh, you wouldn't have worked with Horizon before moving uh, to become an auditor because it hadn't been no. rolled out by 1999? No. What, if any, knowledge did you have of the Horizon system when you worked on the counters in the Huddersfield Crown Office? I can't remember the system back then. It, it was a, a computerised system, but I, I couldn't tell you which it was. In any event, you became an auditor in 1999 and remained an auditor for five years until two, till 2004, is that right? That's correct, yeah. Uh, did you have any qualifications to be an auditor? No. Uh, did you receive any training to be an auditor? I believe it was on the job training. Uh, did you have any training on the um, operation of the Horizon system? I can't remember whether we did any courses or whether it was again on the job training with the system. Uh, did any on the job training um, as an auditor, or indeed later as an investigator, include any discussion of any bugs, errors or defects in the Horizon system? Not to can remember now. Did your training as an auditor on the job or later as an investigator include any discussion about the role of Fujitsu in uh, providing support for the correction of any bugs, errors or defects? in the system? Not that I can recall, no. When you were an auditor, where were you based? Leeds. And did you have a geographical um, area of coverage? Yes. What was that area? From memory, it was the northeast. So I seem to think it was from Lincoln, potentially up to the Scottish border and across to the east side of Manchester. Thank you. What did your responsibilities entail when you were an auditor for those five years? It would have been given a list of officers to visit and confirm cash and stock at branches. What do you mean by confirm cash and stock at branches? Um, from memory, attending a, a branch and just ensuring the assets were on site. So was it essentially a counting function? Yes, basically, yes. If there were discrepancies, did your role as an auditor involve um, investigating uh, uh, why the discrepancies had arisen? 
not can recall. If if it was clear that you could see where the error was made, you would uh, obviously report that. But no, no, it would be passed up the line. Uh, did your role as an invest uh, as an auditor uh, involve consideration of whether the Horizon system was responsible for any discrepancies in accounts or figures? No, I wouldn't have thought so. No. In the witness statement you gave in the Lee Castleton trial, I'm not going to t uh, turn it up at the moment, I'm just going to give the reference. It's poll 308 2945, uh, page 2, paragraph 4. You said that you carried out at least one audit every day, sometimes two or three audits a day, sometimes four, and that in this five year period you completed well over 1,400 audits. Is that accurate? From memory, yes. In those 1,400 um, audits, what um, audit information held by Fujitsu would you have ordinarily accessed when carrying out your audit? As an auditor, none. Uh, to whom did you report at this time? I can't remember my first line manager. I believe my line manager at some point in auditing was John Jenkinson. But sorry, I can't remember any other names. That's right. And how many people were in your audit team? Oh, wow. Um, there were a few different audit teams. I'm going to hazard a get at six, I think, but that probably changed on and off. Uh, between 2004, so um, for two years and 2006, uh, you uh, became an investigator in the security team, is that right? That's right, yes. And where were you based? Sheffield. Uh, what responsibilities did your role as an investigator within the security team entail? From memory, it would have been, you would have been given a case to look into to try and understand what happened in that case. How would you um, understand what had happened in that case? That would have been more looking at um, transactions, findings, results from previous audits. Um, I'm sorry, I don't remember an awful lot in that role. When you say that it would involve looking at transactions, how would you look at transactions? I can't remember whether there was a system that we could download it or we had to go in and look at the actual, when you visited the office. Sorry, I haven't got very much recollection from that. By this time, had you received any specialist training in the operation of the Horizon system? Not that I can recall, no. Had you received any training in the operation of the Horizon system by this time? Other than gaining experience in the years of auditing, and um, not that I can recall, no. Between 2006 and 2016, you say in your statement that you undertook a range of analytical roles, is that right? Correct, yes. Until you left uh, the post office in 2016? I wonder whether we could look at um, some documents, please, to try and jog your memory as to what some of those analytical roles um, were. Can we start, please? And it will come up on the screen in front of you, Mrs. Rose. Um, poll Can you see that this is a document entitled Fraud and Conformance Team, Team Leader Handover, the 3rd of March, 2012? Mm -hmm. So this would have been uh, well into your role as a, um, an analyst or undertaking analytical work in the um, security team, yes? Yes. 
Can you remember what the fraud and conformance team was? Not specifically, no. I know it was a team in Chesterfield, but other than that, no. Were you a part of it? Sorry? Were you a part of it, the fraud and conformance team? Don't think so. Can we turn to page three, please? Um, looking at team purpose, since 2008, additional agency resource has been used on the team to enable detailed branch investigation. This resource has been utilised to check branch accounting activity and has been used to identify new fraudulent indicators. It's also been used to support elements of the Santander contract with Pol to address non-conformance, identify fraud relating to green gyro um, transactions and um, dispatch. Was what is described there part of your role? Prior to this, um, yes, but I can't remember the details, I'm sorry. When you say prior to this, prior to March 2012, um, what do you mean prior to this? Prior to, two, uh, to, it, to that date, um, I used to look at data, I, I can't remember which data, uh, to identify any fraudulent indicators or compliance, but um, I'm sorry, I don't have an awful lot uh, of memory on that. Can we look at page nine of the document, please? There's a, um, a table that lasts um, in summary form a couple of pages, and then in many more pages in detail, called Fraud Indicators Summary. Mm -hmm. And um, you'll see down the left-hand side, there is a, a list of indicators, cash, scratch card, stock, or checks, a level of risk, and then a method of detection. Yes. And you're, um, for the, the first and the third on there, um, cash and checks, said to be a, um, a useful contact. Can you see that? Um, yes. Why were you a useful contact for the fraud indicators of cash and checks? I'm presuming at the time I had quite a bit of knowledge on the data and, and what it was telling people. And um, who, what kind of people contacted you about these fraud indicators? Uh, the, fraud, the fraud team. Okay, so th they were based in Chesterfield and you were in Sheffield, is this right? Uh, no, I, I worked, I was in Sheffield when I did the investigation role. Uh, when I did the analytical role, I was based um, I think initially I was based home working and then it went into Manchester, but I did do quite a bit of work in Chesterfield. Okay. Anyway, members of the fraud and conformance team of which you were not a part contacted you. Yes. Why would you be contacted? What? I can only um, think that at the time I had knowledge to assist any questions. What kind of advice would you give? I honestly couldn't remember. Um, advice on, I guess, where to look for things. But I, I can't remember the systems, I'm sorry. Can we turn to page 23, please? There's a list of key contacts from around the business within this document. And if we um, see about seven or eight lines in, your name is mentioned, and your role is described as crime risk. Yes. Did your role involve investigating branches to look for evidence of criminal activity, such as theft or false accounting? It would have been to identify uh, anomalous behaviour, which would, could be theft, false accounting, compliance, um, human error, uh, various things. 
when performing that role, did you um, consider whether the Horizon system uh, was at fault? That that was amongst the list of potential problems that you ought to encourage people to look at or you look at yourself? At the time, I don't recall that, that coming to light, no. When you were undertaking this role, um, crime risk, uh, did you review what's uh, known as ARQ data? Um, looking at the documents I've been sent over, yes, I believe I could have done. I don't recall any, but potentially could have done. What role did you play in determining whether branches were to be investigated or not? If my memory serves me right, if anything highlighted outside the normal, and I can't tell you what the normal is without seeing the data, um, I would have probably pass that on to somebody to look into further. What role, if any, did you play in determining whether branches were or sub-postmasters operating branches, were to be the subject of prosecutions? No. Did you uh, play any role in supporting prosecutions? Other than providing data for anybody that requested it, no. Can we look, please, at um, poll 2010-5025? This will come up on the screen for you, Mrs. Rose. Uh, this document appears to um, set out the objectives of each member of the security team for um, 2013 to 2014. If we go to the second page, please, we can see that there's an, um, an index and it goes through role by role, person by person. Can you see that? Yeah. That index goes on for, um, for three pages. You'll see there that your name appears. Mm -hmm. um, Helen Rose, security manager, Grapevine. Mm -hmm. And it says go to page 44, but in fact that's wrong. It's page um, 55, please. in the document and we can um, see your role set out and it appears to be one of those documents that sets out in the um, second box in um, an objective and then a time scale for achieving it in the far right hand side. Can you see that? Um, yes. You're described as uh, at this time as a security manager in Grapevine. Uh, what uh, was Grapevine? Um, my memory of Grapevine would have been just a security team name. So it was a security team name, is that right? From memory, yes. And you were um, the manager of it, is that right? Or a manager of it? No, I think security manager was given to just about most people within the security team. Everyone was a manager, were they? I think that was just a, the name that, that people working in the security team at that time were given. You'll see um, in paragraph one, If you just read that to yourself, paragraph one. Mm -hmm. And the third bullet point states the following in relation to your role. Provide end-to-end -end process map for all procedures to identify current known risks. Uh, yeah. Do you remember that being a function of yours, to produce a process map for all procedures to identify known risks? I don't recall it. I, I no, I can't remember it. Would you have produced such a map if um, that was your 
objective for um, the following year? I presume at the time I would have, if that was my objective, I would have produced a process map, yes. And reading this to yourself now, um, it, it, such a map is, um, was to identify current known risks. What would you understand current known risks to refer to? Risks to what or to whom? Um, post office assets. So the, the money and physical um, possessions of the post office? Yes. Can you recall um, whether the map um, addressed any risks inherent in a computer system such as Horizon? I can't recall that, no. Can you recall how large the grapevine team was? No. You can't remember how many people were in it? No, no, I can't. And in res respect of um, Grapevine, uh, how was it different from any other security team? Why was it called Grapevine? I don't know. My very vague mem memory of Grapevine was more external uh, loss, loss um, robberies, burglaries, that kind of thing. I don't, I don't have any other recollection of it, sorry. The first of your objectives um, is listed as um, identify potential fraud investigation and trends. And then skipping to the fourth one, train and develop colleagues on the use of credence and other analytical tools. Would you agree that by 2013, it appears that you played a, um, a role, an important role, in helping to identify uh, potential fraud and trends? Yes. And your role was an analytical one? Correct, yes. And you were, amongst other functions, helping to identify trends in fraud investigation across the business? Yes. You were responsible for training others on analytical tools to um, find fraud and help in the investigation of fraud, is that right? Yes. And your performance was being tested against those tasks? Yes. Can you help us as to what credence was, please? I believe it was a, a, a software program that you could download um, Horizon data, but that's a very vague memory of it. <laughs> By this time, 2013 to 2014, uh, was it the case that the post office, um, in your section of it, relied predominantly on credence for the purposes of investigation? I believe it relied quite heavily on the initial data, yes. There's no reference here or um, elsewhere in this document to um, Fujitsu audit data or ARQ data or even enhanced ARQ data. Uh, does that reflect the fact that um, you would not habitually um, access such data in order to conduct um, investigations? Not in that role, no. And does it... Um, is it also the case that by this time, investigators didn't habitually access Fujitsu audit data or ARQ data or enhanced ARQ data in order to conduct their investigations? I, I don't know what uh, individual investigators would have accessed. This fourth bullet point refers to other analytical tools. Can you recall what they were? No, I can't, sorry. Can we look, please, at um, poll 
Thank you. You'll see this is um, an email from Dave Posnett. Do you remember him? I do, yes. And uh, do you remember um, what function he performed at this time, it's uh, mid-2012? I know from reading the document that you sent me that at the time I believe he was a financial investigator, but I don't know from what dates he did that. And you'll see that it's um, dated the 15th of June, 2012, and it's sent okay. to a wide range of people. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at those, do they appear to be people who worked in the security team or people who were performing analytical functions such as you? I recognise quite a few of the names. Yes, I believe they were a part of the security team. So they're mainly security team people? I would say so, yes. And you're amongst them. Can you see that? I can, yes. Um, it's about case compliance. And do you remember the topic of case compliance? No. Uh, let's read it together if we scroll down, please. Um, all just a little reminder that compliance on green jacket offender files will recommence in July. I associate the emails, I think that means I attach. Um, I attach the emails in it um, and attachments I sent out a month ago, a month or two ago for reference. And if you um, just scroll up, please. You'll see a zip file is an attachment. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then carrying on reading. Uh, the compliance checks on submitted offender file, sorry, omitted, submitted offender interview case files will continue in 2012-13. Associated are all the supporting documents needed, which have been amended where appropriate. I suggest that these are referred to when you have time and or when submitting a, an offender interview case file. Some salient points and changes are summarised below to take effect immediately where applicable. And then there's a list of bullet points of um, changes in case compliance. Do you see that? Um, yes. And so essentially, um, in um, June 2012, um, the uh, contents, in July 2012, the contents of um, case files for offenders um, were going to be checked for compliance. That process was going to recommence, and this was giving everyone a heads up. Yes? Mm -hmm. If we That's just scroll... Good. I'm so sorry. Yes? If we just scroll down... Uh, this communication has been sent out now to inform you in advance of the changes in compliance and provide you with the information needed um, on recommencement of the compliance checks. And you can see Mr. Posner's title. Yes? Yeah. Now, um, we saw that there was a zip file attached. Um, that zip file contained various documents, um, some of which um, I, I would now like to look at. Before we do that, do you remember the need to comply with certain standards when submitting a, an offender file? A vague memory of, of things you had to ensure were in there, but um, in the role I was doing at that time, I wouldn't have been completing those files. But why would you be sent the email? I don't know. I'm guessing because I may have supported people with any documentation. And what do you mean by you may have supported people with documentation? At the time, my job would have been the analytical side, so if people needed things uh, looking at, I, I think I probably assisted them, but to be honest, I can't remember any specific ones. Anyway. I would have been a support, I guess. I'm sorry, I missed that. I would have been a support to them rather than actually providing the green jackets. So you wouldn't have been sending your own green jackets in. You might have been helping other people in the compilation and completion of their own. Of, of any data that they asked for, not the actual completing of the green jacket, no. And so presumably it was important that you had sight of 
the case compliance standards so that you um, could provide that support function knowing the standards which the investigators themselves had to comply with? I would guess that's why I was copied in, yes. And so presumably at the time, I don't expect you to remember it now, you would have read the email and looked at the attachments? Yeah, I would have presumed so, yes. Can we look please at poll 3038452? This is one of the attachments within that zip file. Do you understand? Yes. And if you look at page one that we're looking at now, Security Operations Team Compliance, Guide to the Preparation and Layout of Investigation, Red Label Case Files. Can you remember what a red label case file was? I can't. I'm sorry, no. Um, offender reports and discipline um, reports. And then page two, we can see the purpose of the, the document, essentially. The purpose of the suspect offender report is to provide a storyboard of the events and evidence of an investigation to the relevant stakeholders and post office limited legal and compliance team to enable a decision to be made as to the future conduct of a case. This guide is produced for all security operations managers, irrespective of location. The general principle is that the description of investigation activities should read in the sequence they occurred. The following is only a guide. A single report is required in cases where more than one suspect offender is identified. And then the foot of the page, please. Just a bit below. The aim of this document is to give guidance to security managers, sorry, security operations managers and team leaders on the current compliance then over the page, standards for the preparation of red label case offender reports and discipline reports. And then um, there is set out um, essentially on page three, a template or an index mm -hmm. for what the case file should look like. Mm -hmm. And then if we go to page five, please. we can see um, a template essentially for a case file. And so the preamble suggests that headers and footers should read Post Office Limited, Confidential, Investigation, um, Legal. Does that reflect the fact to your recollection that offender reports were kept internally and not disclosed to those who were being investigated? Um, I, to be honest, I don't know the answer to that. I would imagine if that was completed, the person that you're completing it about should know what, what details. They would have had to provide the details, surely? What do you mean they, they would have to provide the details, the person being investigated? Well, the date of birth, which office, what their name was, what service, what national insurance was. Um, I would think they would have had to be aware. They would be aware that they were being investigated and they could be asked, hello, what's your name? What's your date of birth? What's your um, branch code? What's your national insurance number or whatever? This is saying that the document that is created as a result, the offender report, is to be headed on each page, the header and footer, post office limited, confidential investigation, legal. Yes. Which tends to suggest that it's confidential, it's for the eyes of legal, and would not be disclosed to the suspect. Um, Can you recall whether that is correct or not? I, I honestly I couldn't answer that, sorry. Okay, we'll, we'll see a little bit later in this policy document whether what I've said is correct or not. Okay. Uh, you can see um, on the right-hand side of the page there that um, 
one of the things that investigators were required to complete were identification codes, numbers um, uh, one to seven only. Can you see that? And yes. Uh, I won't ask you about that for the moment, but just um, remember that's there. Can we go forward to page 10, please? And scroll down, please. I'm so sorry, scroll up to um, uh, 1.24, thank you. Paragraph 1.24 of the policy reads, um, as a heading, details of failures in security supervision procedures and product integrity. Uh, this must be a comprehensive list of all identified failures in security supervision procedures and product integrity. It must be highlighted in bold in the report where the security manager concludes that there are no failures in security, supervision, procedures, and product integrity, a statement of this effect should be made and highlighted in bold. Uh, do you remember um, that, that in the offender report, any um, of the four species of failures listed there had to be highlighted in bold in the report? I'm can't remember that, but at this time I wouldn't have been doing offender reports. You would have been seeing offender reports, though, wouldn't you? I would have probably been seeing them as they came through. Um, I honestly can't remember, sorry. Would you agree that that kind of description there is broad enough to capture issues discovered, any issues discovered, with the reliability of Horizon data? It should do, yes. If we go to the bottom of the page, please. Um, we then turn to the discipline report. And can you see there it says header and footer. So this is what's to go at the top and the bottom of the document. Post office limited confidential investigation personnel. Yes? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, can we go, please, to um, page 12 of the document, please? and look at 2.15 at the foot of the page. Uh, a very similar um, paragraph to the one we've just read, details of failures in security supervision, procedures and product integrity. This must uh, be a comprehensive list of um, all failures in security supervision, procedures and product integrity. It must be highlighted in bold, etc. So that's the same as the paragraph we've just read. Yes? Yes, yeah. And over the page, please. Um, significant failures that may affect the successful likelihood of any criminal action and or cause significant damage to the business must be confined solely to the confidential offender report. Care must be exercised when including failures within the discipline report, as obviously this is disclosed to the suspect offender and may have ramifications on both the criminal elements of the inquiry as well as being potentially damaging to the reputation or security of the business. If you're in doubt, discuss with um, team leader. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this um, difference of approach? That um, if it had been discovered that there were significant failures that affected the likelihood of criminal proceedings or caused damage to the reputation of the post office, they weren't to be included in a document that was disclosed to the offender, but were to be kept in the confidential offender report. I don't recall that, sorry. Can you remember anything like that? That any um, failures that concerned the integrity of, for example, Horizon data, or any other failures in process that affected or might affect the reputation of the post office business weren't included in a document that would be disclosed to the suspect, but were included in a confidential legal report? I don't recall that part, but as I say, that probably wouldn't have been part of my role at that time. I would have probably seen a document like this, but I can't recall completing these reports. Uh, can we look, please, that document can come down, at poll 
2011-5672. This is another of the attachments to the zip file. Mm -hmm. And this appears to be um, a template drawn from the policy it, um, itself and is essentially uh, um, in a Word document, uh, either of the first page or a file front page. Do you remember um, the files, the green jackets being set out in a format such as this? I can remember the green jackets used to be set out in a format, but I can't remember any of the documentation in it. You'll see again this requires the um, person completing the file to include identification codes. Can you see that on the right hand side? Um, yeah. Can we look at poll 20115674? Uh, this is another one of the attachments to the case compliance um, email sent to you. Mm -hmm. Um, which contains a list of um, uh, identification codes. Mm -hmm. And so th this document is a, um, an attachment to an email being sent around the security team um, and you in June 2012. Uh, just read it for you yourself, please. Does anything strike you about it? Not really, no. Uh, what was the purpose of recording the identification codes of suspects? I don't know. I can't answer that one. Sorry? I don't, I don't know why we would have been asked to answer that one. Can you recall any discussion as to the purpose of recording the ethnic or racial identity of a suspect? No. Do you know what was done with the information that was recorded as to the racial or ethnic identity of a suspect? No, I don't know. To your knowledge, was any database kept of uh, racial or ethnic identity? Not that I'm aware of, no. Have you any clue as to what was done with the information? No, none whatsoever. Uh, to your knowledge, did anyone say anything at the time about any of the language used in this document? No, not that I'm aware of. And nothing strikes you about it even now? No, I can't actually remember the document, but no. I think you, that document can come down, thank you. Uh, I think you left the post office in 2016. I did. Um, why did you leave? Just a career change. And what have you done since, if you don't mind me asking? Um, analytical and financial roles. Sorry, analytical and financial roles. Yes. Using computers? Yes. Can I turn then to um, the claim against Lee Castleton? you were involved as an auditor of Mr. Castleton's uh, post office branch in Marine Drive in Bridlington in Yorkshire. Um, you provided two witness statements in the claim brought by the post office against him and you gave oral evidence um, at his trial. And I want to ask you about um, each of those events, if I may. In um, a witness statement provided to the inquiry, Mr. Castleton, I'm not going to ask for it to, to be turned up, but it's WITN 03730100, page 2, paragraph 17 and um, 18. Mr. Castleton says that um, he'd made 91 telephone calls over a period to a helpline, and in the course of those had asked for an audit. Was it common for postmasters um, themselves to ask for an audit? Um, I, I don't know, to be honest. Um, as an auditor, you would have been given a list of 
of offices to visit. Um, I wouldn't have dictated which they were. Would you know whether this was a, um, a random audit, a scheduled audit, or one that had been requested by the postmaster himself or herself? Um, 20 years ago, vague memory, we would have been told if it was random or scheduled, but I don't know whether we would have been given details as to why we went. And in broad terms, what did a typical audit process involve at a branch? Uh, verifying assets, cash and stock. And so what would you do when you arrived? Oh, vague memory. Gosh, 20 years ago. Um, but you did 1,400 of them. <laughs> I did, yes, but it is a long while ago. Uh, you would introduce yourself, you would um, check the cash against the system, check the stock, check the transactions. Uh, I, I believe if any differences were found, the postmaster would would be with you at the time of checking it so they could double check your figures, make sure they agreed with your counting and your asset verification. Um, would you... Know, Th thank you. Sorry. Would you consider any um, data before attending an audit? Not that I can recall, no. Would you have accessed any call logs? No. Or any other operational records that may um, record issues concerning discrepancies or shortfalls or other problems at the branch? that you were about to audit? Not that I can recall, no. So if a postmaster had been um, complaining for weeks and months beforehand about um, discrepancies and had been explaining problems with, for example, the operation of the Horizon system, you would be ignorant of that when you walked through the door? Until we got there. As far as I can remember, we didn't do any pre-work for audits. And so in this case, does it follow that you weren't briefed about this branch, nor the contact that had been made by Mr Castleton um, about the Marine Drive branch before your arrival? No, I wouldn't have thought so. Did you speak to um, Kath Oglesby, Catherine Oglesby, before the start of the audit? Oh, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Sorry. Would you typically yeah. speak to the um, uh, sub postmaster's line manager, area manager, uh, before the start of the audit to find out, as had been the case here, that there had been extensive contact about um, discrepancies and shortfalls and the causes of them before you walk through the door? From memory, I don't think so, unless Kath had asked for the audit and I'd given any information, but I can't recall any. By um, at this date, and we're going to see that this is um, 23rd of March 2004, that you conducted the audit, uh, had you been made aware of any issues that sub-postmasters had experienced and had complained of when using Horizon? about the integrity of the data that it produced? Not at all aware of, no. We know that you went on to provide um, a witness statement in this case, in fact, two witness statements in this case. Can you recall how many cases um, over time you provided witness statements in? As an auditor? Or as an investigator? Oh. No, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't put a figure on it. I don't think it would be an awful lot, but I, I couldn't say. It was more than Mr Castleton's case? I would say there was more than the one, yes. Uh, 
were you provided with any um, advice from post office legal or any other quarter in relation to the making of statements and the giving of evidence in court? Not recall any. Was this the first time that you made witness statements for an action um, brought against the sub postmaster? I can't answer that. I don't know. I'm sorry. Uh, when you came to give evidence um, in the claim against Mr. Castleton, mm -hmm. your evidence was based on the typed and handwritten record of the audit conducted on the 23rd of March um, 2004. And you exhibited this to your first witness statement in the proceedings against Mr. Um, Castleton. Let's just look at the witness statement first. It's poll 3082925. That's my mistake. Poll 3082945, thank you. Um, we can see that this is your first witness statement. We can see um, it's dated the 11th of January 2006 in the top right hand corner, yes? Yes. And if we go to the third page, we'll see that um, you signed it. It's in fact obscured by a, um, the general restriction order redaction, but your signature's underneath where it says GRO. Uh -huh. And if we go back to the first page, please, at the foot of the page, you say, I make this witness statement from facts within my knowledge unless otherwise stated. I've had the benefit of reading through the audit papers over the page. References to page numbers in this witness statement are to page numbers of exhibit HR1 to this witness statement. Um, in paragraph five, you give us the date of the audit, 23rd of March, 2004 and the fact that you attended with your colleague, Chris Taylor. You arrived at 8 a.m. Can you see that? Can, yes. And then paragraph eight, please. Um, the handwritten notes of the audit are at pages uh, one to 47. That's of your exhibit, HR1. And a typed copy of the audit is of pages 48 to 64. A copy of the conclusion of my report is at 65. Can you see that? Um, yes. And what you're doing here is this, right? You're referring to the record of the audit in your witness statement because it's a contemporaneous or near contemporaneous record of what happened in the audit. It's like an original note, is that right? That's what it, yes, that's what it reads like, yes. Because when you were writing your witness statement here in January 2006, two years, just under two years had passed you'd conducted hundreds of audits in the interim, and presumably one blurs into the next. 100%, yes. And so what's in the audit record is important, correct? Correct, yes. Can we look at the record of the audit, please? Um, poll 3082946. Thank you. This is your exhibit HR1 on the first page. And then if we um, skip over, we can see the handwritten stuff. And if we skip to the bottom, please, keep going, add a bit more. We can see a page number in the middle at the bottom, one. Can you see that? And um, yes. as you said, that pages one to 47 are the handwritten bits. 48 to 64, typewritten, and then an audit report of page 65 of this document. Mm -hmm. And so um, these parts of the audit record are handwritten by you or your colleague, Mr. Taylor, is that right? Correct, yes. Can we go to page 17, please? Uh, 
I should have started at page 16. Note 17 was correct by mistake. There's a section of the audit notes called um, procedural security inspection. Can you see that? And yes. And this and the following pages of the exhibit um, refer to a procedural security inspection that is carried out, contain a series of um, ticks and um, sometimes some text. Um, we can see the branch name um, of Marine Drive, Mr. Castleton's name, the date of the inspection, um, the manager, Kath Oglesby, and the inspection, C. Taylor. Does it follow from that that um, the procedural security inspection was carried out by your colleague, Mr. Taylor? That looks like it, yes. And then if we go to page 18, please. And let's scroll down to cash and stock. Um, under cash and stock, um, against the question, is the safe kept locked when not in use with the key removed? Um, yes has been ticked. Can you see that? And yes. Um, and then can we turn to page 48, please? Um, this is part of the typewritten um, section of the audit record. And it's from completion by you, because you were the lead inspector, is that right? Yes. And we can see um, the date on which the um, relevant issue was completed. Initials, HH, that's you. I think that's your maiden name. That was my previous name, yes. And then any remarks that were made. Um, and if you just look traveler's checks, serial numbers verified on site, can you see that? It's about seven or eight down, thank you. Yes. Um, you said not applicable. NA, yes. yes. Is that right? I remember this sheet. Um, D does NA mean something else? No, no, I, you're correct. It means not applicable, but um, I am presuming he didn't have traveller's checks looking at that, but I can't remember. Thank you. And... If we look at page um, 56, please. Um, at the foot of the page, the traveller's checks reconciliation. Can you see that? And yes. That's um, all completely blank. Again, that would, um, particularly in conjunction with what you've written already, appear to suggest that there were no traveller's checks in the branch on the day of your audit. That's what it, that's what it would appear like, yes. Thank you. Then can we turn to page 63, please? Um, that's the entirety of that page displayed. And I just want to look at um, a couple of the things that are written on this page to see if they're in keeping with what we've already noted. But to start with, what is this document? I don't know, it doesn't look complete to them. It doesn't look as though it's been finished. No, um, just stopping there. When you came to give evidence, um, subsequently, just cutting through things, you said um, to the High Court that this was incomplete, and it was incomplete because um, Mr Castleton was suspended, and therefore the procedural security inspection was it, it itself not continued, and that may explain why this document is incomplete. Yes. Uh, can you tell, though, who would have completed this? Would it be you or Mr Taylor? You as the lead or he as the subordinate? Um, I honestly can't remember. I would, it would be completed following all the complaints um, pages completed. But as you say, if he was suspended at the time, then this part wouldn't have gone any further. Um, it's... Um, is 
it, it doesn't disclose its author and it's undated and it's not addressed to anyone. No, I think I think it was a template that you would have completed at the end of a, a, an audit where the postmaster wasn't suspended and you would delete or change or add anything you needed to do. Okay, so does it follow from that that the, the list of things here might not actually be referring to Mr Castleton at all? I think it would refer to any any branch and you would delete or add where needed. Okay, and so the fact that this um, uh, procedural security inspection was not completed means that th this checklist here hasn't been crossed through or Correct. added to. Correct. And so would that explain why it says, um, for example, safe left open, where we'd seen the tick previously saying that it was locked, yes? Yes, that, those are the identifiable gaps, and I would believe that the ones that didn't apply would have been removed had, it, had the audit gone um, to the end. OK, and it says travellers' checks not kept in safe, um, even though you've concluded on the basis of two things that you had written, um, that um, there weren't any travellers' checks on branch that day. No, this is just... I read this as being just a template that... Okay. That could apply to any branch. Can we go over to page 65, please? Um, this is um, essentially the audit report, as you referred to it in your um, previous evidence to the High Court. Um, or the conclusion of the audit report. Um, and we can see that it is written by you, is that right? At the top there? Yes, it looks like it, yes. Um, it's dated the 25th of March, 2004. And um, it says an audit took place at the Marine Drive Post Office on the 25th of March, 2004. That presumably is a mistake because it was the 23rd of March, wasn't it? Yes. Yes? Yes. Um, you led the audit and in attendance was Chris Taylor. The audit commenced at 8 a.m. and on our arrival, the sub postmaster was very pleased to see us. Um, he explained problems he'd been having at the office regarding balancing. His problem started in week 43 with a misbalance of minus £4,230.97. He was adamant that no members of staff could be committing theft and felt that the misbalances were due to a computer problem. He'd been in contact with the retail line manager, Kath Oglesby, and the Horizon helpline regularly since the problems began. The following table gives further week's balance declarations on the cash account. Scroll down, please. In week 47, 8,243 pounds 10 was put into suspense. Although Horizon had been contacted and the retail line was aware of this figure, this was not authorized. In week 49, 3,509 pounds and 68 was added to make the amount carried in suspense 11,752 pounds 78. This was also not authorised. On the completion of the audit, the retail line manager, Kath Oglesby, was contacted along with the investigation team and the audit line manager. The sub postmaster was suspended pending inquiries and an interim postmaster was put in charge of um, the office. So um, just picking out a, a few features of that, um, Mr. Castleton was very pleased to see you. Yes? That's, that's what I put, yes. And presumably that would be accurate if you wrote it. I, I presume so, yes. Um, he clearly identified to you that he'd been having a problem with balancing. Yes, clearly, yes. He suggested to you that misbalances were due to a computer problem. Yes? Yes, that's what it said, yes. He um, told you that he'd been in contact with the helpline since right from the beginning and that he'd been con in contact with his retail line manager, Kath Oglesby. Yes. Am I right to think that there's no investigation of what he is saying before he's suspended and an interim postmaster is brought in to run his post office? Instead, he's just suspended on the spot there and then. I, as an auditor, you will pass that over to the retail line manager um, to make that decision. But it all happened quite quickly on the day, did it? 
I believe it did, yes. And is that typical of how things worked at this time? It didn't matter if the sub-postmaster had asked for the audit. It didn't matter if the sub-postmaster had been making complaints for weeks and months to the helpline or to his manager of a computer problem. If there was a shortfall that was not authorised, he was suspended. That would have been the, the decision of the, regional, of the retail line manager. No matter whose decision it was, that's what happened. Is that right? They were just suspended. I, I don't know whether that happened on every occasion. I guess it would depend on, on each, each case. Well, were you ever in, amongst the 1,400 audits that you conducted, a situation where a postmaster was saying, it's not me, it's the computer system. And the line manager said, well, hold on, this is a postmaster that, I don't know, has been working for us, honestly, for 20 years. We need to credit what he or she is saying. We need to conduct an investigation into whether what he says or she says is correct. Let's investigate whether or not what they say is accurate. And they weren't suspended. They were allowed to carry on working. I can't recall any. I, I wouldn't have thought a, re, a retail line manager would discuss that with an auditor. I think an auditor just verified the things, uh, you know, the cash and the stock are uh, discrepancies and, and passed it over. So you wouldn't particularly have been involved in that side. Did you ever hear, um, because you were standing there in the branch, um, it coming back from the line manager, let's not suspend them, let's investigate the merits of what they say. No, I can't recall any. Thank you very much. I wonder whether we could um, take the morning break, um, and perhaps 20 minutes, sir. By all means, Mr Beer. So that would um, bring us back at what time, please? Uh, By your 22. Time, 20 to 11, all right. We'll break now for 20 minutes and come back at 20 to 11. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Uh, good morning, sir. And um, Mrs. Rose, can you uh, both see and hear me? I can. Yes. Thank you very, very much, Mrs. Rose. We just looked at the um, record of the audit conducted by you and your colleague, Mr. Taylor, on the 23rd of March, 2004. I want to um, turn to consider uh, the witness statements that you um, filed in the civil proceedings brought against Mr. Castleton, what was included in them and what changed between the two witness statements. Can we go back to your first witness statement, please? Um, uh, poll 308 2925. So remember, this is your first witness statement dated the 11th of January 2006. We've been through the bits of it which say I rely on the audit record. Yes? That's and we left off on page two at paragraph eight, where you refer us to the handwritten and typewritten sections of the audit report and the, the conclusion of the audit report, all of which we've looked at. And then at page nine, uh, sorry, paragraph nine, you say, as part of the audit, an audit, we have to complete a procedural security inspection. This was carried out by my colleague, Chris Taylor. A tight copy of the procedural and security inspection is at page 63. Remember, we looked at that before the break. The inspection revealed that the safe was left open, the safe keys were left in the safe door, and it was not secured that cash and stock were not secured during lunchtime if the sub-postmaster was not on the premises, that traveller's checks were not kept in the safe and foreign currency was not held securely, that standard procedures for adjusting losses and gains were not adhered to because the losses were unauthorised and personal checks on hand had been incorrectly treated. Mm -hmm. Those are the standard things on the checklist, aren't they? They are, yes. Which... Um, didn't necessarily apply to Mr. Castleton, did they? On reading that, I would have said not, but I can't remember writing this, so... Well, that's what I want to ask about. Yeah. Given that you've told us already that page 63 is a template and hadn't been remember, yes. um, ticked or crossed or deleted or added to, 
Why is it in a witness statement to the court? You're telling the court that all of those failures applied in the case of this audit. That's what it looks like, yes. I'm sorry? I said that's what it looks like, but I... I... Yeah, and I'm asking why. Why it's in there? Yes. I, I can't remember. Well, it's not well, accurate, is it? According to what you've told us already. Look, it doesn't look to me, does it? No. And so why is inaccurate evidence being given to the High Court? I, I can't recall. I, I don't know. You're telling the court in this paragraph here, aren't you? This man, Mr Castleton, was sloppy and slapdash. There are things that we saw when we audited him, audited him that could well explain the missing money. That's what this paragraph's for, isn't it? That's what it kind of indicates, yes. But as I say, I, I don't know why that wasn't picked up at the time of the hearing. Well, we're going to see in a moment that you did something about it. All oh, right. Okay. Um, between the first and the second witness statement. <clears throat> but what I'm asking at the moment is, can you recall how it is that this information was included in your first witness statement when it's not accurate? I can't recall that. Can we um, turn, please, to poll 308 1700 underscore 208? Thank you. This is a record of an email exchange between you and Stephen Dilley, who is the post office's solicitor, on the 15th of September, or the 14th and 15th of September, 2006. So it's about eight months after the first witness statement was filed. Okay? Uh, and if we go to the foot of the page, please. <coughs> Can you see there's an email, slightly hard to read, but it's from Stephen Dilley to you and some other people. Mm -hmm. And it's dated the 14th of September 2006. And the subject is second witness statement of Helen Rose, post office in Castleton. And Mr mm -hmm. Dilley says, I refer to our recent email exchange and attach a second witness statement for your approval, together with just those exhibits that you may not have seen previously over the page. Please, can you read the statement very carefully and make sure you are 100% happy with it, especially paragraph 12. Please, could you also ask my question in bold italics in paragraph 12. Once I hear back from you, I'll draw up a final version and send it to you for signature. Then back to page one, please. You say, Stephen, I read the statement. And then if we go forwards to the fourth paragraph, you say the security inspection was started, but from what I can remember, not completed. The reason for this being that normal audits would require many compliance uh, tests completing, inclu including the security compliance. However, when a postmaster is suspended for whatever reason, then compliance tests are not completed. This would have been started as a matter of routine until we were notified that Mr. Castleton was to be um, suspended. Yes, so you're telling him there that the stuff that's in the witness statement about security inspection, it was a security inspection that was started but not completed, okay? Completed, yeah. And then um, we follow that up with a call a couple of weeks later. Can we look at poll 306-9514? And this is a typewritten telephone attendance note um, completed, I think, by Mr. Dilley. And you'll see that it's dated the 3rd of October 2006. 
Mm -hmm. And he records, I had a telephone conversation with Helen Rose Herkel coming back to me on a voicemail I'd left with her. She'd read the latest version of the statement and she thought it was better in terms of the balanced snapshots. However, she wanted to make a further change to paragraph eight. She said that as soon as the sub postmaster was suspended, the compliance test then became irrelevant. Had it been a normal audit, i.e. had Castleton been carrying on, uh, the test would have been completed and the sub postmaster would have been told to get his act together. But she wanted to emphasize that the compliance test failure weren't themselves the reason he was dismissed. He was dismissed because of the loss of stock, okay? That's a um, building on what you had said in the email exchange, essentially, yes? Yes. And then lastly, can we look at poll 307-1196. You'll see this is your second witness statement. It's dated the 4th of October, 2006. So the day after that telephone call. And if we look, please, at the second page, at paragraph eight, we can see that paragraph seven was um, not dissimilar to your first witness statement about exhibiting the audit report, essentially and then replacing the list of failures in the security audit, the, the checkbox on page 63, is a new paragraph eight. As part of a normal audit, we have to complete a procedural security inspection. This was initiated by my colleague, Chris Taylor. When a postmaster is suspended, then any remaining compliance tests are not completed because of the large number of compliance tests that have to be completed for each audit. Accordingly, although the procedural security inspection was started as a matter of routine, I do not recall it being completed because Mr. Carlson was suspended prior to its completion and it then became irrelevant. Yes? Yeah. And so it, it follows, does it, that um, everything that had been said in the first witness statement in that paragraph nine about failures in security that was in fact just a recitation of a standard list is completely irrelevant to the case of Mr. Lee Castleton? Yes. Uh, wasn't relevant to the reasons why he was suspended and wasn't relevant in deciding whether or not a, um, uh, there was a missing sum of money that was attributable to his conduct? No. Uh, can I um, uh, look, please, at some other evidence that um, uh, you gave, or other aspects of it? Before you do that, Mr. Beer, it may be that I'm being slow, but what about paragraph nine in this statement? Yes. Um, uh, can you help us with that? Um, despite what you've said, um, and you're not being slow, and nine remains. And you'll need to read over the page too. I don't have any explanation as to why that wasn't taken out. Well, Mrs Rose, I am slightly concerned because your evidence to me is, in effect, the paragraph nine in this statement and the previous version in the second statement should, in effect, never have been in those witness statements no. because they're wrong. Mm. Uh, given that you were the person who signed them, I would like you to try and remember why it is they are there. Um, I, have, I have no idea why they are there. I have no recollection of it. I'm sorry. All right. Can we look at some other things that happened between the audit report and the evidence that you gave to um, the court? And I'd like to try and display two documents side by side if I can. The first is um, poll 3082946 at page 65.
And the second is poll 307, 1196 at page two. So 65 of the first document and two of the second. So on the left-hand side, we've got your concluding report to Kath Oglesby, yes? Yeah. And on the right-hand side, we've got the second page of your final witness statement. Mm -hmm. You can see that in paragraph four, you say, on the 23rd of March, I attended the branch at, and you give the address, <coughs> Uh, together with my colleague Chris Taylor, we arrived at approximately 8 a.m., no previous involvement. Yes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You say the process of carrying out the audit involves physically counting the cash and stock, etc. Yes? Correct. Mr. Castleton explained he'd been having problems balancing the books. And you see in the left hand side document, four lines in, you say in that he explained problems he'd been having with the office regarding balancing. His problems with balancing started in week 43 with a misbalance of minus 423097. Mm -hmm. And can you see that you say that in paragraph six on the right hand side? Yes. And then you continue on the left hand side. He was adamant that no members of staff could be committing theft and felt the misbalances were due to a computer problem. Uh -huh. and then on the right-hand side, second sentence of paragraph six, Mr. Castleton was adamant that the misbalances were due to a computer problem and that no members of his staff could be committing theft. Yes? Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Does it follow that you were largely using the audit report as your basis for writing your witness statement? I would think I probably did, yes. You see in your contemporaneous record, you say, on our arrival, the sub-postmaster was very pleased to see us. Can you see that? Yes. Can you understand the potential relevance of that information? Sorry, what do you mean by that? Can you understand the potential relevance of you recording that the sub-postmaster was very pleased to see the auditors? I probably was just stating the fact at the time that he seemed pleased to see us. Why would you include it in your original note? Oh, I don't know, just making notes at the time of, of what, what occurred. You don't make a note of everything that occurred, do you? I wouldn't have thought so, but... So why did you make a note of this? I obviously felt at the time the need to do that. Back in 2004, I can't say why I did it. I obviously thought that it was relevant at the time. You'll see it's not in your witness statement, is it? No. And why is that? Well, I was going to take years later. I don't know, can't answer that one. Do you know why it was omitted from your witness statement, given that the witness no. statement was seemingly based on what is said in the original note? I have no explanation for that, why, why it would be, I guess the report was more uh, to Kath, uh, whereas the witness statement was just a witness statement, so. No, I don't know why it wouldn't be in both. Well, let's um, look at um, some other issues then. You see in the contemporaneous note, after the bit that's highlighted, it says he'd been in contact with the retail line manager, Kath Oglesby, and the Horizon helpline regularly since the problems began. Mm -hmm. That's not in your witness statement, is it? 
No. You understand the potential relevance of that information, don't you? But that would be him saying he'd done that rather than me being a witness to him doing that. Why did you record that he had said it in your original note? Why? Yeah. I guess we just noted down things that happened, so... Um, I don't know. Why was it omitted from your witness statement, again, when the witness statement was seemingly based on what was said in the original note? I don't know. Do you think these two pieces of information might assist Mr. Castleton? He was very pleased, or he was pleased to see the auditors, and he told you, I've been in contact with the retail line manager, Kath Oglesby, and the Horizon Helpline regularly since these problems began. No, I'm, I can't answer for what I did back in 2004, but I can only presume that the audit report would have been part of the evidence and so it wasn't duplicated. If that's the case, there's no point in making a witness statement, is there? You say, please see my audit report. I have nothing more to say. I don't know. Can you see in the audit report on the left-hand side, there's no reference to Mr. Castleton coming back from lunch smelling of alcohol or having consumed alcohol, is there? No. If we look on the right-hand side, if we go forward a page to page three, please. You say, I do remember, paragraph 10, Mr. <coughs> Castleton left the branch at lunchtime and returned in the afternoon smelling strongly of alcohol. Mm-hmm. So there's no reference in the contemporaneous note of nearly two years previously to that issue. And that's found its way into the witness statement. How's that come about? I don't know. It must have been a comment I felt necessary to mention, but I can't remember it. Wouldn't that be a relevant matter to record at the time rather than years later? Potentially. For f I think the audit report was just a, a report of what happened on the day of the audit. I, I don't know why that wasn't in all came later. So why is it that these two bits of information that might help Mr Castleton have been excluded from the witness statement, but the paragraph 9 has been left in and paragraph 10 has been added? I honestly don't know why other things have not been included at the time. Can we turn to what you said about this when you gave um, evidence at the trial? Poll 307183, thank you. This is a transcript of the evidence that you gave um, to His Honour Judge Havery QC on the 11th of December 2006. Mm -hmm. um, if we can scroll down, please. We can see that Mr Morgan appeared on behalf of the Post Office and Mr Castleton appeared in person. And if we can just go to page 11 of the transcript, please. At the top of the page, you're being asked by Mr. Castleton some questions uh, not dissimilar to the ones I'm asking. And you say, I was asked if there was anything specific I could remember. 
and, and then some inaudible words, I can remember I smelled alcohol on you. He says, no, I appreciate that, so that's your opinion, inaudible words. Answer by you, it's just a vague memory I had of the office. Right, okay. It's presumably one and a half years ago, um, two and a half years ago, yes. And how, um, a question, a lot. Can we go back, please, to um, page 475? Can you tell me what that is, please? The first page of the audit report. And that's the, the document that I've been showing you at page 65. No mention of alcohol um, there. Answer, because it, um, it wouldn't be relevant. And then question, but it is contracted in audible words. Answer, several in audible words. And then the judge intervenes again, as it is an issue in the, uh, in the case, but you are putting to the witness that you did not smell of alcohol. Mr. Carson, I strongly did not, my lord. And you say, well, I can only apologize. I can only go by what my memory was. He says, I appreciate that, but in audible words, just clarifying between what the audit report and what your statement says. And you say, I wouldn't put it in the audit report because something have any relevance to whether or not the money was there or whether the audit was, the office was short or um, presumably not. Given the fact that you say there that it wasn't in the audit report because it wouldn't have any relevance to whether the money w was there or not, whether the office was short or not, why was it included in the witness statement? I don't know. Looking back on it, maybe it shouldn't have been. Can we go, please, to poll 3071231? Um, this is a copy of one of the drafts of your second witness statement. Um, sorry, your first witness statement. Um, if we just scroll through it, please. You'll see that, um, uh, and it's Mr. Dilly who sent it to you, has included in um, square brackets after paragraphs some questions to you in bold and in italics, yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if we just go to the third page, please. Uh, we see that paragraph, paragraph 10, where you had written, it was in the first draft too. Uh, I do remember that Mr. Castleton left the branch at lunchtime and returned in the afternoon smelling strongly of alcohol. And he, the solicitor, asked you, was he drunk? Yes? You see, that's what he's asked, yes. And in the final version, you don't add to that. You don't say that he was drunk or he wasn't drunk, yes? We've seen the final version. Yeah. Standing back, that can come down now, please. Standing back, um, looking at the two passages that were not included in the witness statement, but were in the audit report, about Mr. Castleton saying he was pleased to see you and that he'd reported matters to the retail line manager and the helpline. And the inclusion of the paragraph nine information about failures in um, security measures and the addition of that Mr. Castleton smelt strongly of alcohol. Did you ever feel that you were being encouraged by your employer to include matters that were helpful to it, the employer, and exclude matters that were helpful or potentially helpful to Mr. Castleton? No. In those circumstances, how has the witness statement ad ended up as it is, with those two things that were in the audit report in, uh, not in the witness statement, and the addition of the alcohol and the failures in security audit. 
Sorry, what do you mean by that? But how, standing back, how has this happened? I don't know. I clearly did the witness statement two, two, some, two years after the audit report and picked out the bits that I believe needed to go in it at the time. And why wouldn't you just say, for example, it's only a sentence, Mr. Castleton was pleased to see us? I don't know. OK, I'll move on to a different topic, please. Um, can you remember performing the role of disclosure officer? No, I can't remember that being a role that I had. Can we look, please, at FUJ 0015-5090? At the foot of the page, it's not an email exchange that you are um, included in. If we just scroll up a little bit, sorry. Thank you. It's an email from John L. Singh, a post office solicitor, to Gareth Jenkins and some others of the 1st of October 2012. And Mr. Singh says to Mr. Jenkins, welcome from your annual leave and your assistance advice in the past prosecution cases. I understand you're assisting my colleagues at present. I need your urgent, um, I think that's supposed to say assistance, the judge has this morning ordered the prosecution to have the following report ready to be served within seven days. On, and I think that's advice, Post Office Limited have appointed one of their investigators, Helen Rose, as disclosure officer dealing with horizon challenges. She has prepared a document stroke spreadsheet detailing all such cases, past and present, approximately 20 in total although none thus far successfully argued in court. Post Office have been advised to obtain an expert's report from Fujitsu UK, the Horizon system developers, confirming the system is robust. Post Office maintain the system is robust, but in the light of adverse publicity from legal viewpoint is that defence should be given opportunity to test the system should they still wish to do so on consideration of um, our um, report. You see it says that um, the post office has appointed one of its investigators, you, as its disclosure officer dealing with horizon challenges. Yes. Were, were you appointed as the disclosure officer? I've seen that report in the documentation that's been sent to me, but I don't recall being appointed as a disclosure officer, but clearly that's what they called it. Did you ever receive any training in the role of a disclosure officer in a criminal investigation or prosecution? No. At this time, you were seemingly aware of a number of cases where there had been challenges to the integrity of Horizon data. Was this the first time you were aware of Fujitsu being contacted to provide an expert report confirming that the system was robust? Um, I can't answer that. I don't think I was in that email, was I? No. Yeah. But you, um, according to this, uh, had prepared a document or spreadsheet detailing cases. Can you remember having uh, been asked to do that? I've seen that report in the documents. I can't actually remember present, uh, producing it, but I have actually seen the document in, in the um, evidence pack. Can we look, please, at Fujitsu 
This is um, a summary of information seemingly reviewed by you, mm. and it appears to be one iteration of the document summary circulated to Mr. Jenkins in advance of a report that he wrote. Yeah. Um, if we look at page five, please. And scroll down. And a bit more, please. We can see that um, it's authored by you, a member of the post office security team on the 30th of August, 2012. Yes. Is that how you would have regarded yourself as at August 2012, although you were performing analytical roles, you were part of the security team? Yes. If we go back um, to the first page, please. You say, in overview, over the years, some post offices under investigation for losses have claimed the Horizon system is at fault as the post office is dependent on the reliability of our system to be able to prosecute offenders, we have to be able to defend our system in the courts. Um, is that a reasonably accurate representation of your belief at the time? At the time, yes. What research did you undertake in order to compile this list of, in this instance, five cases? Um, I actually don't remember writing this report, but looking at it and reading it, I would uh, summarise that I pull reports up, um, audit reports or even uh, investigation reports. So, um, in what systematic, or was, it, was that done in any systematic way? I couldn't answer that. What was the purpose of writing the report? I presume somebody must have asked me to pull some things together. I honestly can't remember. As I say, I can't actually remember writing this report, although my name is on it, I can't remember writing it. You would want to know the purpose of the report and what was going to be done with it before writing it, presumably. I must have understood why it was wanted at the time, yes. Would you have understood that it was meant to be a, um, a complete and comprehensive list of challenges to the integrity of Horizon data? Um, I couldn't comment on that um, without seeing what the request was before the report was written. At the time of writing this report, which is August 2012, uh, were you aware of um, any of the following um, bugs, errors, or defects? Um, th they have been attributed names that broadly describe um, the problems. Um, something called the receipts and payments mismatch bug. No. Uh, the calendar square or Falkirk bug. No. The suspense account bug. No. The Dow Mellington or branch outreach bug. No. The reming in bug. No. The reming out bug. No. The local suspense account bug. No. The reversals bug. No. The data tree build bug. No. And the gyro bank discrepancies bug. No. And so what did you do? Did you just search through some um, old case files and look for cases where Horizon had been called into question? I potentially did. As I say, I don't remember writing this, but that looks like what I've done. Just look um, at the brief summaries of some recent challenges. Uh, yet, Mister, yet Minster. Brief overview. This case came from a tip-off made by a holiday relief post mistress. It was established that Miss Tracy Merritt also operated the outreach post office at Chetnell. Both these offices were audited on Thursday, the 29th of September, 2011. At audit, yes, Min Yetminster was reported to be 
8,000 odd pounds short and Chetnall outreach uh, 3,000 pounds um, uh, odd short, giving a total overall shortage of nearly 12,000 uh, pounds. During interview, Ms Merritt produces a large document regarding an ongoing inquiry by Shoesmith solicitors in respect of the Justice for Postmasters Alliance, stating she believed the post office equipment, Horizon equipment, was the actual cause of this loss. At the start of the interview, Ms Merritt blamed the Horizon system and stated she had problems with transferring cash from Yetminster to Chetnall outreach. Halfway through the first tape, Ms Merritt states, because there are issues with your computers, and I know the post office are not going to admit it, but there is. Six minutes into the second tape, Ms Merritt states, I'm not trying to blame the Horizon system, I'm saying my office kept coming up with losses. Towards the end of the second tape transcript, Ms Merritt admitted that the losses had been accumulated since the end of July 2011. She had not been putting money in for these losses, simply rolling the losses and inflating the cash. Mr Gary Thomas, lead officer in this case, commented at the end of his report that it should be noted that um, this case is likely to be a further challenge towards the integrity of Horizon. And then outcome scrolling down. Uh, recoveries, three charges of fault account, false accounting, letter sent to Ms Merritt, and then there appears to be a cut and paste of the letter to her. Can you see that in the last bullet point? Yes. Then over the page, uh, Post Office Limited remains entirely satisfied as to the evidential strength of its case against you. And then at the end of the letter, any such allegations will be robustly defended. Post Office continues to have absolute confidence in the integrity of the Horizon computer system and its branch accounting processes. Did you take any steps to satisfy yourself as to the accuracy of what was being set out here, i.e. yourself, no. to investigate or cause to be investigated at whether the Horizon system and its branch accounting processes um, had integrity? No, I think this report looks like I've taken uh, summaries from um, case files. So these would have been what have been documented in the case files. And so in respect of all of the five branches there, all you're doing is really transferring from a case file what is said there into a, a shorter document? To a summary. That's what it looks like, yes. Okay, in which case I won't ask you about the other um, uh, four. Um, say for the last one, um, Seema Misra, um, which is on page four, please. West Byfleet, an audit took place on the 14th of January, which revealed a shortage of £74,000. Uh, Ms Misra informed the auditors that the account would be short by between fifty and sixty thousand uh, pounds. She completed a handwritten signed statement to the auditors blaming previous staff for the shortage. Summary: Ms Misra admitted during the interview she knew the office accounts would be short. She continued to blame old staff. Uh, Ms Misra says the office had been running short of cash for about a year, and she had been trying to reduce the loss by putting in money from her own shop business. No point during the auditor interview was any in Horizon integrity issue raised. Comment from legal uh, memo of the 25th of March 2009. The defence have also asked the question, which I set out here verbatim. When was it that the post office first became aware that there were irregularities with regard to the accounts? Was it when the final audit was carried out or had there been concerns at an earlier stage? Uh, this was the first time that the integrity of the Horizon system was mentioned. Um, in 2009, Ms. Misra's defence team offered a plea to false accounting, but not to theft. Uh, post office prosecution team didn't accept the reduced plea. An expert witness was put forward by the defence to challenge the integrity of the Horizon system. And then outcome at the bottom of the page. After a, a lengthy trial at Guildford Crown Court, the jury came to a verdict when they found the defendant guilty of theft. The case turned from a relatively straightforward general deficiency case to an unprecedented attack on the Horizon system. Is that your language, or are you cutting and pasting that from somewhere else? No, I would say that was cut and paste from the um, case file. Uh, we were beset with unparalleled, uh, or an unparalleled degree of disclosure requests by the defence. Through the hard work of everyone, Council Warwick Tatford, investigation, over the page please, Officer John Longman, and through the considerable expertise of Gareth Jenkins of Fujitsu, 
we were able to refute all suggestions made by the defence that the Horizon system was faulty. Um, again, um, is that cut and pasted or is that your judgment? I said that was cut and pasted. It's hoped that the case will set a marker to dissuade other defendants from jumping on the Horizon bashing bandwagon. Again, is that cut and paste? I would say so, yes. Uh, Miss Misra was found guilty of theft, sentenced to 15 months imprisonment, also found guilty of false accounting and sentenced to six months um, imprisonment um, uh, concurrently. And then your conclusions. Presumably this is you writing, rather than being cut and pasted. Like I said, I can't remember writing this report, but it does look at the uh, other meetings. Although there have been attempts to discredit the Horizon system via the courts, um, all, uh, to date the post office has been able to defend the integrity of the Horizon system at all levels. Is that how you viewed this attempt to discredit the Horizon system rather in the courts, rather than people accused of crime defending themselves? I can only read what, what was put there. Um, no, we, can all, the we can all read what's put there, but I'm asking Absolutely. you, is that how you viewed it? This at wasn't people trying to defend themselves. These were attempts to discredit Horizon. At the time, I was not aware of any Horizon issues and the bugs that you've mentioned. I was obviously not aware of them. When questioning the integrity of the Horizon system, the defence solicitors are making similar disclo disclosure requests, indicating that disclosure requests in future challenges will be similar to those made in past Horizon integrity challenges. Depending on where the loss was identified, this can sway the disclosure request slightly into requiring further details and operating procedures around specific transactions, including background processes, either processing of checks once they've left the office and electronic transfer um, records. There have also been requests for information on training materials and training records, including call logs to MBSC. In the MISRA case, the defence questions a lot of technical aspects of the data held at Fujitsu. These challenges were refuted by Gareth Jenkins. And then future actions. Were these your ideas here? I, I can't answer. I don't know. Well, it looks like it, that, doesn't it? The, if the earlier... It looks, like, it looks like it, but I don't know whether that was um, in liaison with anybody else or just purely my comments. The first um, part of the process um, had already put in, been put in place. Where there is any possible challenge to Horizon, um, this will be reported in the 48-hour offender report. Was the purpose of this to alert the post office to, as you call them, attacks on Horizon's integrity? No, I would have. I read that as it, it is trying to understand if there is any further questions on it. And what was the process then? Oh, I can't remember. I, I can't remember what the process was back then. Your report continues, all operational personnel have been asked to report directly to me when at any point throughout the interviews or court process that the integrity of the Horizon system has been mentioned. This will be continually monitored, updated to ensure we're aware of any Horizon integrity challenges at the earliest opportunity and prepared for any future challenges at all stages of the investigation and prosecution process. In taking on this role, other than looking at some past case files, did you take yourself any steps to satisfy yourself as to the integrity of the Horizon data? No, other than gathering information. Were you asked to commission any expert or independent uh, review of Horizon integrity? Not that I can recall, no. Did you speak to any um, IT experts, uh, whether within or outside the post office? Not that I can recall, no. Did you ask um, what um, Fujitsu knew about any bugs, errors or defects in Horizon? 
No, not that I can recall at this time. But did you ask what work had previously been done to test the integrity of the system? No. But were you asked by the post office to take any steps to better understand any weaknesses in the system and consider no. what ought to be disclosed in response to any defence disclosure request in your role as disclosure officer? Not to recall, no. Instead, were you willing to accept the stock line that Horizon was robust? At the time of writing this, yes. Can I turn to a report that you authored in June 2013? That document can come down, please. Relating to transaction logs at the Lepton sub post office. And can we start by looking at Fujitsu 3086H11? Thank you. Now, you've been shown a copy of um, this report um, when you were making your witness statement earlier in the year, yes? I vaguely remember this report, yes. Yes. Uh, you'll see that it's said to be version one of the report. Yes. Last edited by you on the 12th of June, 2013. And if we go to page three, please, and look at the foot of the page, just a bit further down, please, we can see that um, it was authored by you on the 12th of June, 2013. Yeah. Uh, you were still within the security team, but you were described as a fraud analyst by then. Yeah. That this report explains um, a problem at the Lepton branch that was um, a, a, an issue that was quoted again and again over the next um, decade or so, essentially. And I, I want to ask you about how you came to be commissioned to write this report, something about the, con the content of it and the consequences of you writing it. But just going back to that first page, please. We'll see that it's um, said to be draft. Mm. Do you know why, um, do you know whether it remained a draft? I don't, I don't know. If it wasn't finalised, can you think of a reason for that? I can't, no. No. You'll see that it's um, said to be confidential and legally privileged at the top of that page and indeed um, all other pages. Uh, did you include that, confidential and legally privileged? I would have probably been advised to put that on, but I couldn't tell you who, who asked me to put it on. Do you know in what circumstances the legal privilege that you're referring to there arose? I don't know. What um, type of person uh, performing what function would have advised you to include the words confidential and legally privileged? I have no recollection of, of who would have advised me to put that on. If we go over the page, please, to page one, looking at the executive summary, um, a transaction took place at um, Lepton um, sub post office um, with the FAD code 19320 on the 4th of October at 10.42 a.m for a British Telecom bill payment for 76 pounds and nine pence. This was paid for by a Lloyd's TSB cash withdrawal for 80 pounds and change given for three pounds 91. So um, two transactions there, is that right? That's what it looks like, yes. Yeah. A, a customer needing to pay their BT bill for 76 odd pounds <clears throat> taking £80 out of um, a cash account with Lloyd's and being given change for £3.91. Yes? Yeah. 
And then at 10.37 on the same day, the British Telecom bill payment was reversed out to cash settlement. Can you explain what reversed out to cash settlement uh, means? From memory, it, it, the, um, the transaction would have been reversed out of the system. Yes, what does that mean? Uh, taken back out of the system, cancelled, I guess, if that's the right word to call it. So the, the BT element of the two transactions was reversed out, meaning, is this right, that uh, the system showed that there was a reversal so that the yeah. BT bill was not paid and, in yeah. fact, £76.09 pence was withdrawn from the system yeah. and paid out as cash. Yeah. So you've got an unpaid BT bill. Paid bill, yeah. Exactly. Uh, the branch was issued with a transaction correction for £76.09, pence, which they duly settled. However, the postmaster denied reversing this transaction and involved a forensic accountant as he believed his reputation was in doubt. So in short, this sub-postmaster is saying, although I paid the shortfall of um, £76.09, pence, I'm adamant that I didn't make the reversal, I didn't get the money back out. Yeah. And is it right that the overall um, conclusion was that although a reversal could appear in the credence data as though it had been done by the sub-postmaster, in fact, it was the system and not the sub-postmaster that had created the reversal? That's what it turned out to be on this case, yes. Thank you. That gives the context for um, the issue. Yeah. Can you help us as to, um, in relation to the commissioning of the report, why were you tasked with um, producing this report? I can't remember who asked me to do the report. Um, I can't actually remember who asked me to look into it, but clearly somebody did, and I looked at the data and... Um, Irrespective of who, who asked, um, can you remember why would it fall to you, given your job um, as a fraud analyst in June 2013? Um, I, I must have been asked to look at it, look into it to see if I could um, understand what had happened. But did you, for example, hold particular expertise in the analysis of Horizon transactions? I did used to look at Odd ones, yes. Had you previously had experience of investigating discrepancies shown on the Horizon system? Uh, at the time, I used to look at a lot of the uh, Horizon system data, yes. I'm thinking about discrepancies in particular. Are you sure um, calls? Some, yes. Can I turn to your um, methodology? Can you remember what your method was, how you went about investigating this issue? I can't now, other than what I can read in the report. And on reading what's in the report, does it appear that you essentially asked a series of questions to Mr Gareth Jenkins in email form? Yes. He replied, and you essentially cut and paste his, your questions and the substance of his answers into the report? Did, yes. Uh, can we look at a couple of documents side by side? On the left-hand side, can we have Fujitsu 3086811 at page three? And on the right-hand side, poll 3097481 at page three? Page three of each document, please. Um, thank you um, very much. 
On page three of the report, that's a left-hand side document, you say about halfway down the page, I can see where this transaction is and now understand the reason behind it. My main concern is that we use the basic ARQ logs for evidence in court. And if we don't know what extra reports to ask for, then in some circumstances, we would not be giving a true picture. And then if we look at the right-hand page, your email to Mr. Jenkins at the top of the page, ignoring the first four words, I can see where this transaction is now and understand the reason behind it. My main concern is that we use the basic ARQ logs for evidence in court, etc. Yes? So we can see yeah. that you've cut and paste the bold text in the report from am, yeah. your question to Mr. Jenkins. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then if we, on the left-hand document, uh, go back, sorry, on the right-hand document, go back to page two. You see the Mr. Jenkins' reply. I understand your concerns. It would be really relatively simple to add an extra column into the existing ARQ report, etc. And mm -hmm. then on the left-hand side, can you see answer? I understand your concerns, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Yeah. That's it. So it appears that the way you've gone about things is ask Mr. Jenkins a series of questions, cut and paste the substance of what you've asked and the substance of his reply into the report. Yes? Correct, yes. That's aside from the, um, the recommendations part, which I'll come back to in a moment. Can I ask you um, some questions about um, the substance of what you said to Mr Jenkins and his replies? Um, let's start with the email that we're looking at on the right-hand side and just go back to page three. You say at the top of the page, I can see where this transaction is. That's the reversal transaction shown by some data that um, has been provided, some ARQ data. Mm -hmm. And now understand the reason behind it. Uh, and you say, my main concern is that we use the basic ARQ logs for evidence in court. And if we don't know what extra reports to ask for, then in some, in some circumstances, we would not be giving a true picture. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that this suggests that you understood the significance of what Mr. Um, the data that Mr. Jenkins had given you? Um, I would say that it made me realise there were there was more data available than what came through in the basic logs. But it's a bit more than that, isn't it? it, it firstly, you realise the significance not only for the branch at Lepton but more generally for criminal actions being pursued by the post office, for criminal proceedings being pursued by the post office. Yeah. Because you say we use basic ARQ logs for evidence in court. If we don't know what extra reports to ask for, then in some circumstances, we would not be giving a true picture. And that means we may not be presenting a true picture in evidence to the court, doesn't it? Yes. Either way, yes. That would um, obviously be a significant concern for you, that the post office is not presenting true evidence in court, wouldn't it? Yes, which is probably why I put it in there, yes. And it would be a significant concern for the post office, wouldn't it? Yes. Did you consider that if there was a discrepancy between what could be understood in the ARQ data that you received and in the raw data, there were likely to be cases where a prosecution had been perce had proceeded without a true picture being presented to the court. On the data I looked at here, it was just to do with um, reversals of transactions. This is raising a wider point though, isn't it? Uh, we, get ba we get basic ARQ logs. If we don't know what extra reports, i.e. the reports you've now shown me, Mr Jenkins, show, 
we, we may not be presenting true evidence to a court. It's what you're saying, isn't it? Yes, it's just saying make us aware of other things that we can ask for. So that the post office can give true evidence to a court? Yes. You carry on in your email. I know you are aware of all of the uh, horizon integrity issues. And I want to ensure that the ARQ logs are used and understood fully by our operational staff that have to work with this data both in interviews and in court. <clears throat> Does this suggest that by February 2013 you were aware of, quote, all of the horizon integrity issues? No, not all of them. I would be aware that <coughs> questions were being questioned on Horizon, which is probably why I needed to understand what had happened here. What were, refer what were you referring to when you said, I know that you are aware of all the Horizon integrity issues? <laughs> I believe I would have just been referring to the fact that we needed explanations on, our, on this particular case rather than anything... Um, anything indicating bigger issues I, I wasn't aware of. I just needed to understand this one. Mrs Rose, that sentence is not talking at all about data in this case. It's talking about a broader point, isn't it? You're saying to Mr Jenkins, I know you are aware of all the horizon integrity issues. It's not talking about... Um, different species of ARQ logs, is it? Um, I think it was just meaning we needed to get, get an understanding of what had happened. It doesn't say that, does it? It says, I know you're aware of all the in horizon integrity issues. And my questions are, what horizon integrity issues were you aware of? And what horizon integrity issues did you know that Mr Jenkins was aware of? I didn't know that he knew of any. And this was the first real um, difference that I'd come across. Why did you, if you didn't know that he was aware of any inter, uh, horizon integrity issues, why did you email him and say, I know you're aware of all of the horizon integrity issues? Because there would probably be talk going around, and I guess he would have been aware of it. So it's just re referencing the rumour mill, is it? Yes. Can we look at page one of the same chain, please? If we see here, you're referring the email string to um, Elaine Vanden Bogard and Elaine Spencer. And you say, for information, email string may be of interest. I'm not really sure where to take this. Happy to try for a change request if you would like me to. But at this moment in time, I don't want to tackle one small issue when we may need to challenge deeper issues with the way we see data from Fujitsu stroke credence. You appear by this time to have understood how significant it was that there were, if it was the case, that there were things that could appear differently in the underlying audit data as opposed to the ARQ logs that you were being given, correct? That's what it looks like, yes. And you were sufficiently concerned to escalate this to Angela Vanden Bogart? Yes. Can you recall um, following up this to see whether or not the recommendations that you made in your report at the foot of the page on the left-hand side were followed? I don't recall following that up. You say, I do believe the system has behaved um, as it should. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. And I do not see this scenario occurring regularly and creating large losses. I'll come back to that too. 
However, my concerns are that we cannot clearly see what has happened to the data available to us, sorry, on the data available to us. And this in itself may be misinterpreted when giving evidence and using the same data for prosecutions. My recommendation is that a change request is submitted so that all system created reversals are clearly identifiable on both Fujitsu and Credence. Mm -hmm. Are you aware whether that um, change request was ever submitted? I'm not aware whether it was or wasn't. In your mind, did this, um, what you had identified, call into question the consistent position of the post office by this time, that the Horizon system and the data it produced was robust? I believe on this occasion the system, the Horizon system behaved as it should have done. Um, reading that, my concerns were that we couldn't actually see, we could see the reversal, but it wasn't, it didn't indicate that it wasn't done by the postmaster as opposed to a system reversal. So just dealing with the, I do believe the system behaved as it should. Mm -hmm. What your report describes is that a transaction reversal was generated by Horizon without any input at all by the sub postmaster, correct? Correct. The transaction reversal was entirely a creation of Horizon. It was a transaction done by, generated by the system and nothing to do with him, correct? Correct. And yet the system appeared to suggest to the outside world that the sub postmaster himself had generated the reversal. The basic system did, yes, but once Gareth provided the data, it, it proved that it, it had been um, some kind of a failure in the, in the, I believe it was the um, internet, the telecom link. How, um, in any possible world, is that the system behaving as it should? The, I, I believe that the Horizon created, he should have reported that the reversal was a system reversal, not a, um, is it an existing reversal? I can't remember. Um, which was clearly identified in the, in the Fujitsu data, but not on the Acumologs. There was no separate code which identified no. that this was the system at work and not the correct. sub postmaster at work, correct? That was a fault I found on this occasion, yes. And additionally, the credence data was inadequate to show what had actually happened. Indeed, not only was the data inadequate, would you agree, it made it look as if the sub postmaster had done something that she or he or she had not done, and which the system Correct. had done. Correct. In what respect is that a system behaving as it should? Because when we got the underlying data, it actually showed what had happened. Yes, but th th that's a question of how visible is it if we pick away at it. My question is, how is it the system behaving as it should? that it created a transaction reversal of its own motion without any input by the sub postmaster. That was clearly my findings on the day. Yes, but why? I can't answer that. That's what I believed at the time, that the system had done how it should. But looking back, how could it be? A system had showed money paid back to the sub postmaster that was invisible to him, in what respect is that a system behaving as it should? That, well, I can only look at what I put recommendations back in 2013 and that was obviously my belief at the time. You say you do not see this scenario occurring regularly. On what basis did you reach that uh, judgment? Um, I seem to remember vaguely that it, it was to do with a failure in the connections between the 
uh, bill payments going through. So unless the bill payments failed all the time, then it, it wouldn't happen. How did you know whether they did or they didn't? Um, well, you wouldn't, would you, unless somebody like Lepton brought it up that said, I'm having losses and these are the reversals that I haven't done. And they commissioned a forensic accountant to back them, them up, even though it was only a loss of just under £80. Did you make any recommendation that um, a backwards look take place, considering the integrity of any um, evidence that had been given in criminal prosecutions? I don't recall doing on this occasion. Or the integrity of civil actions taken against individual sub-postmasters for debt recovery? I wouldn't have done that, I don't think, now. So I wonder whether we could take the second break um, of the morning there. It's um, 5 to 12 now. I wonder whether we can uh, break until quarter past. Yes, we can. Um, but there's th just that last sentence of that document, Mr. Um, Beer. Uh, sorry to interrupt again. Well, not interrupt, add again. Uh, you've been asked questions, uh, Mrs. Rose, by Mr. Beer about how this um, could be the system working properly, and you sought to answer them. But I'm puzzled by your last sentence. My recommendation is that a change request is submitted so that all system-created reversals are clearly identifiable on both Fujitsu and Credence. Now, my understanding of that language, and I hope I'm not being too... Um, linguistic about this is that you are acknowledging that a system created request has occurred which should not have occurred and so you want some change made so that if it happens again it will be clearly and obviously visible to anybody who looks for it. Now is that a fair interpretation of what you've written? I would say so yes. Right fine thank you. Now we can have our break, uh, Mr. Thank Pierre. you, sir. In fact, we're going to follow that up um, a little bit after the break, too. I, I thought you might, but I, I couldn't resist it. I'm sorry. Th thank you very much, sir. Uh, good afternoon, sir and Mrs. Rose. Can you see and hear me? Yes, thank you. And yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, you should um, still have on the screen... Uh, <laughs> two documents. Can uh, you confirm that's the case? Yes. Thank you. I just want to revisit um, on the left-hand side um, the conclusion of your report. To start with, just to go back and give you the opportunity to comment on this, the sentence that says, I do believe that the system has behaved as it should. Yes. Uh, by that, are you meaning that uh, because there was um, a power outage or an internet failure or some communications difficulty, the transaction wasn't completed Correct. and the system generated a transaction reversal. Yes. And in that respect, the system was, not, was behaving as it should. Yes. Overall, the system was not um, operating well, though, in two respects, would this be right? Because firstly, there shouldn't be that kind of communication breakdown in which the need for a transaction reversal arises. And secondly, there was a concern about the visibility of what had happened and the implication that this was the postmaster's um, actions that had done it. Yes. Is that yes to both parts of that, that question? Yes, I don't think that the issue was with the way that the horizon behaved, considering what happened. The issue was with what the data presentation and what we could see in the basic logs. Now then, on the right-hand side of the page, back in February, 
because you had already been emailing Mr. Um, Jenkins about this, mm -hmm. you concluded this um, chain by telling um, senior managers, um, including Angela Vanden Bogard, that um, firstly, look at this chain, but you say, I don't want to tackle one small issue when we may need to challenge deeper issues with the way we see data from Fujitsu stroke credence. Yeah. By that, were you meaning, look, on this occasion, the tr this was a transaction correction that we couldn't see that it was system generated, but there may be other issues, deeper issues, that we're also not cited on. My understanding of that email, I can't remember writing it, but my understanding of that email is, is basically what what you've just said, yes, we can see that one, but we'd need to understand what the other um, changes that need to take place. So are there other reasons why um, the system does auto-reversal so that we could see everything all in one go? And so although this may have been a transaction um, reversal arising because of a communications glitch or whatever, you were making a, a broader point that there's a class of data that we're not seeing here. Uh, that's what the deeper issue is. I guess we just needed to understand, uh, was it an issue? Were there other things that we couldn't see? And you say that you're happy to um, try for a change request. That's what I put in there, yes. And by that, you mean a formal um, contractual submission that would alter the relationship between Fujitsu and the post office concerning the data that it was uh, Fujitsu was obliged to supply. That's what I believe a change request would have done, yes. I don't recall ever putting one in, to be honest, but... No, well, we're going to hear evidence it. later in the inquiry from Mr Jenkins that no change request was ever um, submitted. Right, fair enough. Yeah. Um, but that's in February you're saying that. And then yes. in... June, your document on the left-hand side of the same year, in the last paragraph, as the chairman has pointed out, my recommendation is that a change request is submitted so that yeah. all system-created reversals are clearly identifiable on both Fujitsu and Credence. Yes. By all system-created reversals, is that the wider or deeper issue that you were referring to? I would have only referred to the issues that I was aware of. So I guess I would have only been referring to the system failure, you know, the uh, system connection issues as opposed to anything else. Well, here you're, you say that your recommendation is that all system created reversals yes. are, are visible to you. Yes. This report um, is dated June 2013. At the time of writing, you were obviously aware that sub-postmasters had been prosecuted on the basis of Horizon data for um, uh, over a decade before the, this. Yes, potentially, yes. What do you mean potentially? I can't quote any that I was aware of, but I would think I probably would have been aware of some at that stage. Well, you must have been aware that sub-postmasters were being audited, including by you, 1,400 times, and sometimes that turned into a prosecution. It did, but at that time I wouldn't have known of any particular... No, I'm not asking for, for names, I'm just saying no. you would have been aware that sub-postmasters yes. had been prosecuted. Yes. 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 And they'd been prosecuted on the basis of Horizon data? Yes. And you were aware that civil actions had been brought against sub-postmasters, also reliant on the integrity of Horizon data? Yes. The concern that you express here is about future prosecutions, isn't it? It's about being able to see the data. But it's about really? looking to the future, yeah. isn't it? Yes. You didn't make any recommendation to revisit cases in the past, did you? Not on this report, I didn't, no. 
did you, other than on this report, make any recommendations about revisiting past cases reliant on Horizon data? I can't recall if I did. Do you know whether that issue was raised by Ms. Vanden Bogard or anyone else? I wouldn't know. Was um, that raised with you? Not that I can recall, no. Did you remain involved in work about um, Horizon data integrity following the completion of this report? I'm not sure. I can't recall if I did or not. Well, in the three years that you got left to serve until you left in 2016, what did you do? Um, I think the final two plus years I dealt with external crime reporting. So that would be robberies, burglaries, gas attacks. So completely away from this. Can we look, please? Um, both those documents can come down, please. At poll four zeros. Thank you. Uh, this is um, an advice uh, written by a man called Simon Clark, an in-house barrister employed by a firm of solicitors called Cartwright King, who the post office used at this time to prosecute many criminal charges against um, sub-postmasters. Um, if we just go to um, page 14, please, and look at the foot of the page. It, you'll see that um, it's dated the 15th of July, 2013, so a month or so after your report that we've just looked at. Mm -hmm. If we just go back to paragraph one, please. Um, Mr. Clark says, I'm asked to advise the post office on the use of expert evidence in support of prosecutions of allegedly criminal conduct committed by those involved in the delivery of post office services to the public through sub post office branches. By and large, these allegations relate to misconduct said to have been committed by sub postmasters and or their clerks. So that's the um, purpose of the, um, the document. And then if we go to page five, please. Um, at paragraphs 14 and 15, Mr. Clark says, for many years, both Royal Mail Group and latterly the Post Office has relied upon, um, he calls him Dr. Gareth Jenkins, for the provision of expert evidence as to the operation and integrity of Horizon. Dr. Jenkins describes himself as an employee of Fujitsu Services Limited and its predecessor company, ICL, since 1973. He holds a number of distinguished qualifications in relevant areas. He's worked on the Horizon project since 1996. He is accordingly a leading expert on the operation and integrity of Horizon. Dr. Jenkins has provided many expert statements in support, in support of Post Office Limited and Royal Mail Group prosecutions. He has negotiated with and arrived at joint conclusions and joint reports with defence experts, and he's attended court so as to give evidence on oath in um, criminal trials. And then page 18, please. Sorry, page eight. Sorry, my mistake is page nine. Um, starting at the heading, Helen Rose draft report dated um, 12th of June. Uh, this is your report that's being referred to here. This report is based on a series of emails passing between Helen Rose, a post office security fraud analyst. The emails appear to have been sent received over the period of 30th of January to the 13th of February 2013. The essence of the contact is a question and answer process between Helen Rose, and then he calls him a Dr. Jen Jennings. I think that's a reference to Mr. Gareth Jenkins. In circumstances where Helen Rose 
is inquiring into a reversals issue at the, um, the Lepton office. I again extract a number of paragraphs. I'm not going to um, read those, we've looked at them already. 27, Miss Rose's ultimate conclusion is that this is not an issue which uh, suggests a failing of Horizon itself, rather it's an issue of data presentation, i.e. the problem appears to be that the ARQ logs do not distinguish between system generated and manual reversals. The answer being to create a new column in the IRQ log to facilitate that distinction. The report, however, does allude to horizon issues. The 30th of January email is suggestive of the proposition that Dr Jennings does not know what went wrong. And the 13th of February comment is suggestive of the fact that Dr Jenkins knows of other horizon um, issues. So um, your report featured as part of the material relied on to reach the conclusions um, that um, uh, Mr. Clark did. If we go on to page 14, please. Sorry, 13, my mistake. And just look at conclusions. Uh, what does all this mean? In short, it means that Dr Jennings has not complied with his duties to the court, the prosecution or the defence. Reading on 38, the reasons as to why Dr Jenkins failed to comply with this duty are beyond the scope of this review. The effects of that failure, however, must be considered. I advise the following to be the position. Uh, Dr Jenkins failed to disclose material known to him, which, but which undermines his expert opinion. This failure is in plain breach of his duty as an expert witness. Accordingly, Dr Jenkins' credibility as an expert witness is fatally undermined. He should not be asked to provide expert evidence in any current or future prosecution. Similarly, in those current and ongoing cases where Dr Jenkins has provided an expert witness statement, he should not be called upon to give that evidence. Uh, rather, we should seek a different independent expert um, to fulfil that role. Notwithstanding that the failure is that of Dr Jennings and arguably of Fujitsu being his employer, this failure has a profound effect upon the post office and post office prosecutions, not least by reason of Dr Jenkins' failure. Material which should have been disclosed to the defendants was not disclosed, thereby placing Pohl in breach of their duty as a prosecutor. By reason of that failure, there are now a number of convicted defendants to whom the existence of bugs should have been disclosed but, not, but was not those defendants remain entitled to have disclosure of that material, notwithstanding their convicted state status. Um, I'm not going to read the rest of it. But were you informed that in July 2013, the post office had been advised that um, Mr Jenkins had not complied with his duties to the court, to the prosecution or the defence? No. Uh, was um, uh, that brought to your attention in the remaining three years of your service with the post office? No. Was there discussion after um, this date in July 2013 that the um, uh, post office had been advised that Mr Jenkins was in breach of his duty as an expert witness? No, not that I can recall. And that he couldn't provide evidence in any current or future prosecutions? No, not that I can recall, no. This must have been, um, or would you agree that this is quite significant news in the security team, isn't it? Uh, yes. And it was in part based on your June 2013 report? It appears to be, yes. Do you um, remember whether um, the contents of your report created quite a stir at the time in the security department? Not, no, not really. I, I can remember sending it uh, through line managers, but I, I don't know who saw it or, or what happened with it. After your... Um, so, sorry, just pick, picking up on that last answer. You said you can remember sending it through line managers. Who would that be, the, the June 13 report? I'd, I'd have to go back over the emails to see who was line manager and who I sent it on to. I don't know where it was forwarded on after that by anybody. Did, um, were you ever uh, made aware in the remaining three or so years that you were in the post office that your um, uh, report had, um, had these consequences? No. 
was the last thing that you therefore um, heard of in relation to your report, the submission of it, and that was the end of the matter? From memory, yes. Thank you very much, Mr Rose. They're the only questions that I ask of you. So I know that um, at least one other core participant has some questions to ask. In fact, only one core participant has questions to ask. All right, well, let those questions be put then, please. Thank you. It's the Hodge, Jones and Allen team. I don't know whether it's um, Ms Page. It is Ms Page. Thank you. Thank you. I ask questions on behalf of Lee Castleton, amongst other sub-postmasters in the inquiry. Now, we've understood from your witness statement that you moved to the security team in 2004, so not long after the audit of the Marine Drive branch, is that right? Correct, yes. And by the time of the trial and preparing your witness statement, you had been there for, uh, in the security team for about two years? Yes. Could we take a look, please, at poll 3070763? This is a phone note by Stephen Dilley, the solicitor who acted for the post office in the, um, the trial of Lee Castleton. And he has made this note, having had a telephone conversation with you. We can see that there at the top. Um, SJD3, yes. having a telephone conversation with Helen Rose and A. Hollingworth. Yes? Yes. If we uh, scroll down, we can see that he uh, covers the content of your witness statement. He's about to, to talk to you about your witness statement. He says, um, in paragraph one, that you're an investigations manager and so forth, and describes that you've moved. Uh, but if we go down a bit further, and we go to the top of page two, he says, summarising what you've obviously said to him, in layman's terms, her conclusions were that Mr Castleton was fiddling the books. She had never seen the horizon system cause the problems that Mr. Castleton said it was causing. She thought, in her words, that he was, quotes, shifty. Uh, do you recall saying those sorts of opinions to Mr. I Dilly? Can't, I can't recall that conversation whatsoever. If we go to the final paragraph as well, my impression of Helen is that understandably her memory has faded over time and that she will need to rely heavily upon her audit to refresh her memory of events. She doesn't remember some details that we would like, for example, about how long the safe was left open for and why, and what Mr. Castleton said about it. Just pausing there, that suggests, doesn't it, that he actually spoke to you about the safe being left open and that was something which we've now agreed was simply irrelevant and wasn't what had happened. Your colleague had ticked the box saying that the safe had been left as it should, hadn't it? I, I can't recall the audit at all. I'm sorry. I, I can see what you're explaining, but I don't have any recollection of it. Well, what we can see here is that the solicitor has actually asked you to consider the issue of the safe... You had the same paperwork that we've all seen, and you knew that the safe had actually been left as it should. Why didn't you tell the lawyer that? I can't recall. You appreciate, don't you, that your witness statement, signed by you as true, said something that was incorrect about that, didn't it? It obviously said what I thought at the time, but I have no recollection of it at this moment in time. All right. Well, a final sentence. However, she did come away with the strong impression that he was fiddling. <laughs> Do you remember having that strong impression? 
Mm, I don't recall saying that, no. You, by then, were used to the way that the security team worked, weren't you? After two years, probably, yes. You were used to assuming that sub-postmasters were shifty and fiddling, weren't you? Not all of them, no. That was the mindset you'd become accustomed to in the security team. Is that right, Mrs Rose? No, not all of them, no. It was a mindset of prejudice against the sub-postmasters, wasn't it? No. And you were used to giving statements in accordance with that mindset. That's why you included everything which went against the sub-postmasters, even if it wasn't in your notes, didn't you? No. And that's why you included things which weren't in your notes, which would hurt Mr. S Mr. Castleton, such as the um, supposed going out for having a drink at lunchtime? No. It comes from a mindset of prejudice, doesn't it, Mrs. Rose? No. No. And don't include anything in the statement which might support the sub-postmaster's case. That's, again, the mindset of prejudice, isn't it? No. Uh, let's um, look at another document briefly, which arises from your time in security. Um, if we could bring that one down and bring up poll 30867843 This is a report uh, following what was obviously a, a tragic and serious incident when a sub-postmaster who was accused of fraud committed suicide, a Mr Michael Mann. Do you recall this? I've read the documentation which is refreshed, but I don't recall the investigation now. You don't recall an investigation into a sub-postmaster who killed himself? I can recall an incident. I can't recall the details of the investigation. This happened only 10 years ago. We're not even talking 20 or 30 years ago. You say that you don't recall this. No, I said I don't recall the incident, the actual investigation. Under the heading Introduction and Terms of Reference, we see that the report details the findings from the series of fact-finding interviews that I completed. This is Mr. Colin Stretch completed at the request of an HR officer. And it says in italics below that, the head of fraud letter contains direct allegations around the conduct of Mr. Bradshaw and Mrs. Rose. So you don't recall there being an investigation into your conduct? No. These would appear proper to commit to an internal fact-finding that should, to offer maximum transparency, be conducted outside the line. And then we see below um, that in the methodology, this gentleman who conducted the report says that uh, he conducted interviews with you, Helen Rose, and Steve Bradshaw. In other words, the two, peop the two people who had been accused of uh, misconduct. And then we see further down in that first bullet point that we can see at the moment. Yes, there we are. All seven people interviewed were consistent in their responses that Bradshaw and Rose had behaved professionally. This includes the views of Bradshaw and Rose commenting upon their own and each other's behaviour. During my interview with Bradshaw, he stated he would not have done anything differently and that he considered Helen Rose and himself to conduct themselves professionally. So, um, do you recall these interviews at all? The interview between uh, you and the man investigating your misconduct? I didn't know it was a misconduct. I can remember there being an inquiry, but I didn't know it was a misconduct interview. 
Is this a situation where you and Mr Bradshaw covered for each other? Absolutely not. You gave interviews to this chap investigating the misconduct and you said that each of you had behaved in a, in a perfectly professional manner, didn't you? Got into that, yes. Is that really how you thought of Mr Bradshaw and the way that he conducted investigations? Yes. Mrs Rose, just a couple more questions. Your 2013 report into the Lepton branch, sorry, the um, document can come down. Your 2013 report into the Lepton branch, that was quoted uh, again and again over the next decade in support of the sub-postmasters, wasn't it? I don't know, I didn't follow the case. They used it repeatedly throughout the group litigation, didn't they? I don't know, I didn't follow the case. Do you say that you never became aware that your report was being used to help the sub-postmasters cause? No, I didn't follow the case at all. And you're literally unaware. When did you first become aware of this? I had heard that it had been used, but I didn't know in what context it was used, because I didn't follow the case. When did you hear it was being used in this way? I can't remember. I remember it being mentioned, but I didn't know why it was being used. I didn't follow the case at all. Who was keeping you informed? Oof. No idea when it might have been mentioned in passing conversation, but I didn't follow the case at all, so I don't know. I didn't know how it was being used. Why didn't you follow the case? Because I didn't. I'd left post office. I didn't follow the case. Did you leave post office because this report was a black mark against your name? No, I don't believe it was a black mark, and I didn't leave for that reason. Is it something that stalled your career? No. Your memory failures throughout your evidence and throughout your witness statement have permitted you to avoid questions about your conduct over some 20 years. Are these memory failures really genuine, Mrs Rose? Absolutely. I left post office seven and a half years ago. I have no recollection of a lot of the things. Is it really an unwillingness to face the unpleasant truth that your conduct has helped the post office to victimise many, many sub-postmasters? Not at all. And Mr Castleton specifically? No. Thank you. That's it. Is it Ms Page? It is. Thank you, sir. And no one else wishes to ask Mrs. Rose any questions? Uh, no, I don't think so, sir. Unless Thank you have you, any Mrs. questions. Rose. No, I have no further questions. Thank you, Mrs. Rose, for making your witness statement and for coming to give evidence. Yeah. And um, I think that concludes today's session, Mr. Beer, yes? It does. Um, so we're back 10 a.m. tomorrow, sir. Yes. All right. Well, I'll uh, be present at 10 a.m. tomorrow. Um, in spirit, if not in body. I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you very much. Thank you.